Ring around the rosy, a pocket full of posies. Ashes, ashes, we all fall down. If that version of the nursery rhyme, Ring Around a Rosy, sounds unbelievably creepy to you, that's the idea. There's a popular story that the song was originally not simply the soundtrack to a delightful children's game, but a form of testimony about the Black Death, the bubonic plague that ravaged Europe in the Middle Ages. In this interpretation, the roses referred to in the song are the red ringed sores which marked the bodies of those who contracted the plague. The posies were flowers or herbs used in a vain attempt to ward off disease. The reference to a tissue, a tissue is the sound of the ill sneezing. And we all fall down, obviously, refers to the plague's ultimate effect of widespread death. Sadly for those who like their history dark, the idea that Ring Around a Rosie was originally about the bubonic plague is probably not true. Folklorists say there's no trace of the song existing until much later in the 18th century. But the reason why that story is plausible is because the bubonic plague was one of the most significant events in human history in terms of its effect on popular culture. It was in response to that pandemic that artists began for the first time to personify death as the Grim Reaper. It gave birth to artworks which are still horrifying, like the Dutch painter Bruegel the Elder's The Triumph of Death. And the iconography of that time is still with us today in the use of skull patterns in fashion. The Black Death inspired folk tales, songs, and stories which would be passed down through generations. And that got us thinking, will the same be true of what's happening currently? As the world faces the greatest social disruption since World War II, as a result of a badly understood disease killing hundreds of thousands of people, what mark will this moment leave on art, fashion, film, literature? On this week's show, we're thinking about Tomorrowland, the fascinating connections between pandemics and pop culture. To help us explore, we're talking to experts in fashion, film, and to a South African author who just spent five years immersed in a fictional pandemic, only to emerge into a real one. Welcome to Don't Shoot the Messenger, the Daily Maverick podcast where we bring you the stories behind the stories. I'm Rebecca Davis. Earlier I mentioned the enduring legacy of the bubonic plague on modern fashion because it was in the era of the Black Death that we saw the first visual depictions of skulls and skeletons, still a popular motif on clothing today. And although the idea that disease can influence fashion may sound far-fetched, it makes much more sense when you consider that pretty much all the biggest changes in fashion come from social disruptions. If you look also after World War I, for example, before the war, especially in Europe, the style was mainly directoire, which was those floor-long dresses women wore with quite a high waist. And it wasn't very practical. It had quite a heavy fabric, velvets, and so it wasn't the most practical dress. And after the war, after World War I, women started to wear pants because they had to take more work as men were at war. Skirts became a lot shorter and the line, instead of being long and quite body embracing, turned into a line. Sometimes they wore them over their trousers. So there, there was a need for more freedom of movement and that gave birth to the flapper look that you saw in the 20s and in the roaring 20s and that was made iconic in The Great Gatsby. And it was also the birth of Coco Chanel style, which is iconic because she's been often synonymous with liberating the woman from corset and also very much a constraining outfits. And she used tricot and jersey fabric and, and she launched simple style, boxy lines, shorter skirts. She was, you know, reinterpreting the navy stripes that she saw on the navy soldier. So those important events or traumatic events did help also to liberate, in a way, fashion. That's Emily Gombad, former editor of Elle South Africa and currently editor of Maverick Life, Daily Maverick's portal to all things lifestyle and culture related. The question of how times of crisis like the one we're in can influence the arts has been on Emily's mind recently. She says even purely political ruptures, like the French Revolution, have often caused profound shifts in people's relationship to fashion. 
funny enough, fashion was even debated between 1793 and 1794 by the Société Populaire et Républicaine des Arts, which was kind of France Royal Academy of Arts. And they made a point to make sure that clothing should not advertise anymore the person's rank or status, which it was pretty much doing before, and that it should allow for free movement of the body. So the French Revolution, and then obviously there was all the iconic garments that were symbolic of what side you were during the French Revolution. And really there was a big shift in fashion from that moment. Emily says that there's a number of different ways in which fashion tends to shift after moments of serious social crisis. One is a kind of rebellion against what's just been happening. So after months or years of restrictions on movement and commerce, fashion can suddenly erupt with exuberance and opulence. And she says this is what happened in the fashion houses in post-war Europe. The one is an explosion, usually of colors, because if you had restriction and if you had, you know, like what we saw during the World Wars, for example, was obvious of that need to completely break away from what had been on for that time. So, for example, Dior, Christian Dior, after the World War II, launched his first collection in 1947, and his collection was like incredibly feminine and it had skirts that one was called Chérie and it was like a reversed flower and it was open on the ankle and it was ultra feminine and opulent and actually the editor-in-chief of Harper's Bazaar at the time called it the new look because it was such a break from what had been going on before the war and definitely during the war where it was you know restrictions civilian and military uniforms. Some people are predicting that this is exactly what might happen when the current lockdown lifts globally too that you'll see people sick to death of wearing sweatpants every day at home respond to their freedom by donning kind of outrageously creative, personal, eclectic outfits as an expression of relief. Those people will not include me, by the way. For me, the most positive aspect of the lockdown is definitely the opportunity to wear pyjamas for days on end without shame. But when the worst of the COVID-19 pandemic fades, we're also going to be emerging into a world facing the worst recession in most of our living memories. And Emily says it's equally likely that this factor will make itself felt in fashion instead. When you have an economic crisis, what you have seen in fashion throughout the years is a reverse kind of trend that is more going into minimalism. People have less money. You have to be careful. You you can't just go and overspend. And that means that you saw, you know, like the big trend of the 90s, minimalism. And after 2008, you saw that again. So it's more like cleaner looks, again, neutral tones. So in essence, when all this is over, we're either going to be flouncing around like drag queens or trudging down the road in monochromatic smocks. Could go either way. Another factor that's going to play a major part in what post-pandemic fashion looks like also comes down to logistics. In a situation where global trade is still disrupted, for instance, certain fabrics might just not be available for a while. So necessity might have to be the mother of invention. And that's a principle Emily says she's already applying to her wardrobe right now. When lockdown hit South Africa, she was in a remote part of the Karoo with only a small suitcase. And that's where she has remained. In a way, it reminded me of my grandmother. So my grandmother was a seamstress back in France. And she always, I mean, she had a big attic. And in the attic, it was filled with dresses and clothes that she had made at the time. And a lot of those clothes had been made after World War II, where there was no fabrics or no access to clothes because fabric was Russian and you couldn't access any clothes. And she was making dresses out of nylon from parachutes that the soldiers left into the field. And I remember as a young girl playing with her wedding dress that was all made in parachute and it was so light and like, I mean, you can imagine like the lightness of the fabric of the parachute. And in a way, I think that's what I have been doing. I mean, I cannot compare what I'm going through with what my grandmother or anyone was going through at the time of war. So it's absolutely not a comparison, but it's just more of a reflection of trying to be creative with what I had and not being able to buy anything else, not having a desire to buy anything else, but just being inspired also by the clothes that I actually cherish a lot. There are also already suggestions that the nature of coronavirus itself may shape fashion trends in the near future. That men will be less keen to cultivate beards, for instance, for hygiene reasons. 
and that long nails for women will be out of style for a while because so many people are wearing surgical gloves. It may seem frivolous to talk about fashion in the middle of a pandemic, but Emily says that moments of global crisis like this one actually serve to illuminate the vital purpose of artists and designers in human society. Artists have an incredible talent to express our fears, our common fears, and trying to make sense of the world around us. But they also leave an imprint of what we've all been going through. One of the artistic genres which gives us the clearest imprint of social disruption is, believe it or not, horror movies. When we're back, a film expert tells us how the impact of diseases like AIDS can be traced through cinematic horror. Our podcast is only as good as you make it, so please rate us on Apple Podcasts and leave us a review. My name is Thor Jensen. I'm a writer and editor for a bunch of different outlets, including geek.com, PC Mag, Newsweek, a bunch of other places. I write a lot about science fiction. I write a lot about science in general. So a lot of my work is examining how these things intersect. Thor is pretty much a walking encyclopedia of sci-fi and horror. And he says that although there's a popular conception that sci-fi writers are concerned only with the future, it's what's happening in the present that usually has the greatest impact on their work. As a writer, you're always looking to the world around you for inspiration. And science fiction, even from the early days of like Jules Verne and H.G. Wells, they were seeing these sort of incredible advances in mechanical technology. They were seeing what machines could do. And so in their science fiction, they saw, oh, we're in this mechanized age. What else could machines do? Maybe they could take us to the moon or maybe they could take us through time. So these early sci-fi stories were very much about exploring the fantasy limits of a mechanized society. And then as technology grows and increases, we see the scope of that increasing. Like as we discover new things about genetics, for example, as we discover how DNA works, science fiction said, well, what are the outer limits of this technology? As we discover artificial intelligence, what are the outer limits of this technology? So the seed is planted in reality, and then science fiction writers sort of grow a forest around it. The implication of this is that today's events, pandemic, lockdown, the whole shebang, are almost certainly going to inflect the work of current sci-fi writers and directors in ways that might not even be clear at the time. Thor says this is exactly what happened in response to the early days of AIDS in the late 80s and early 90s, when neither the virus or the disease was well understood and there was a kind of mass social panic around it. Some of the blockbuster horror and sci-fi movies of that era play on the fears around blood, infection, and physical wastage. David Cronenberg directed the remake of The Fly in 1986. It's one of the most memorable horror movies of the 80s for me because it really shows Cronenberg, who is a master of what we call body horror, which is when your physical form is corrupted or taken away from you by an external force. Remember The Fly? Still one of the creepiest films ever. Jeff Goldblum, as an eccentric scientist who uses a teleportation machine without realizing a fly has slipped inside the machine with him and subsequently transforms into this grotesque giant fly. Oh no. What's happening to me? Am I dying? Is this how it starts? Am I dying? He makes a sort of choice, you know, to use this unprotected new technology and it destroys his body and destroys his body gradually. And I think that was one of the biggest sort of physical metaphors that people got from watching AIDS patients as a very long-term disease where visually you could see its progression in the body. And that was very unusual, you know, in the 20th century, the late 20th century, not a lot of diseases had that kind of very obvious physical manifestation. So I think a lot of what we see as analogy and metaphor in science fiction kind of runs with that, that sort of physical wasting or changing was a big aspect of that. And the fly has that in spades. Jeff Goldblum, who plays the main character's body, sort of changing against his will. Another film of the era which incorporates the social panic around AIDS to horrifying effect, Alien 3. Talking about Alien, the Alien franchise and AIDS, the movie you talk about is Alien 3. That's like the most sort of explicit about it. Was there an alien on board? Yes. That was released in 92, so it's definitely the peak of the crisis when people were really thinking about it. And so a lot of the uh, subtext in Alien in the movies entirely is that 
uh, it's very sexual, like you're penetrated by this alien creature who sort of infects you, lays an egg inside you. The first alien movies are kind of a pregnancy allegory. They're a forcible impregnation allegory. So what Alien 3 does has a lot of visual subtext about AIDS. It shows like Ripley, the main character, is shaved bald and she's like worsening physically. She becomes feeble as the movie goes on. And it's also set in a male, like an all-male prison, you know. So there's a lot of references there into how people were interpreting the AIDS crisis. So it's we get both sort of deeper metaphor of like what the alien is and what it does, and then also sort of surface symbolism to reinforce that metaphor. At a time like this one, you might think that people would do anything to avoid watching movies or reading books which are in any way pandemic-related. But actually the opposite is true. The 2011 film Contagion which is about a pandemic loosely based on the outbreak of SARS in the 2000s, is topping download charts around the world. Sales of the 1978 Stephen King novel The Stand have gone through the roof. It seems there's both a kind of comfort and morbid fascination in watching or reading depictions of events comparable to what we're going through right now. But Thor says that one major difference between today's global lockdown and screen portrayals of societies dealing with pandemics is that in the TV or movie version, there's almost always a cluster of strangers who have to band together. Typically in a pandemic movie, what you get is you get a group of people from different backgrounds kind of thrown together, right? And that's not really happening with where we are now. We're with our families. So one of the things I was thinking of a lot that we're seeing, and actually it's interesting that we've seen a lot in horror in the years leading up to that is movies that are very much about sort of like small, isolated family groups, stuff like Bird Box or Us, which is very much about a family group, or A Quiet Place, which is very much like these small, isolated family groups, paranoid of the outside, paranoid of, you know, an invisible enemy in the case of many of these movies, sort of not trusting or not wanting to come into contact with anything outside of that family group. So I think it's interesting in a way that that in hindsight seems very similar to what's happening now in which we're very much clustered you know we don't want to expose our family groups our tight tiny groups to anything outside of them both for their benefit and for ours as a sci-fi and horror buff thor says that he's expecting the current pandemic to produce some in his words really lousy cash-in garbage in the form of books and movies in the near future but he's also fascinated to see what kind of art emerges. One of the things that's interesting to compare to for me is 9-11, where after 9-11, a lot of movie makers, a lot of you know, TV shows were like, well, what do we do? Like The whole world has changed. The way we live has changed. The way we think about our neighbors globally has changed. How do we make fiction that sort of understands this new normal? Someone who has made fiction which not just understands this new normal, but also predicts it to a certain extent is South African author Lauren Bukas, a homegrown literary star who's smashing it on the international stage. Her latest novel comes garlanded with praise from none other than Game of Thrones writer George R. R. Martin, and the likes of Stephen King have also raved about Lauren's work. Her new book is called Afterland. It was released in April in South Africa, and it is truly compulsive reading. I tore through it in a day. But when Lauren started writing it five years ago, she had no idea that it would be published in a real-world context which has eerie echoes of her fictional world. Here's Lauren giving a basic rundown of the plot. So there has been a global pandemic of something called the Calgoa virus. It presents as flu and then it has all these complicated side effects, including very aggressive prostate cancer. So it kills everyone with a prostate, including trans women, but that does mean it kills 99% of the male population as well. So Cole is on the run with her 12-year-old son, Miles, They've been kept up in quarantine. The US government really wants to like hang on to them and like keep them safe and protect them. And Miles is a very valuable resource for the future of America. And she's not having it. And she's on the run from the government, but also from the worst person in the world that she knows, who is her sister. And her sister has aligned herself with some very, very, very bad women who are involved in boy trafficking. As I was reading Afterland, I made a list of all the freaky ways in which Lauren's fictional pandemic mirrors what's happening today. In Lauren's book, there are looted shops and people constantly warning each other to wash their hands. People circulate all kinds of conspiracies as to what caused the pandemic. Countries like North Korea keep their infection rates a state secret. And people say things like, 
it's nice to see nature coming back. Reading Afterland, much of which was written years before we knew anything about the coronavirus, is an almost eerie experience. And Lauren has her own list of parallels between her fictional world and the real world. There's one great line about, sorry, it's my line, I know, but there's a line about how you just can't imagine how much the world can change in six months. You just can't. And it's been much shorter than that. It's been much shorter than six months, and I can't believe how much the world has changed. The quarantines, people running out of hand sanitizer, flights being grounded, weird kind of, you know, super rich people bunkering down in beautiful places. In in the book, it's a wine farm in the Napa Valley. As she mentioned, Lauren's fictional virus kills off men at a far higher rate than women, which is another similarity with COVID-19, of course. Fortunately, it doesn't look as if our pandemic will cause the scale of death that Lauren's does, which results in a society which is ruled and populated almost entirely by women. To me, honestly, that doesn't sound all that bad. There's already been some research, by the way, suggesting that current female leaders have been way better at dealing with the pandemic than male leaders. But in Lauren's imagined world, things don't turn out so rosily. It's not a feminist utopia. No one's making other people friendship bracelets and doing communal gardening and singing, you know, having sing-alongs in the evenings. There is some of that happening, but the power structures are still the power structures and the patriarchy is a very comfortable pair of shoes that you can just slip into. It looks like a brutalist fortress from the outside, but once you're inside, it's kind of a mansion. It's quite a nice place to live. So I wanted to play with those ideas and, and the, the fact that women are full people and we are just as capable of evil, just as capable of selfishness and greed. Lauren says that while she was in the process of writing the book, she would meet people in different industries and ask them, How would it affect your industry if all the men disappeared tomorrow? And I was doing some ride-alongs with Cape Town Metro Cops for a project that I was doing a few years ago and hanging out with these two detectives, sorry, constables. We were driving around through, you know, Mannenberg and Hanover Park and like some quite hectic areas. And I said to them, what would happen to the gangsterism and the drugs and the crime if all the men disappeared tomorrow? And I'm like, "Would would it stop? And they laughed at me and they said, are you kidding? Like Mama American, when she ran the Americans, she was scarier and more hardcore than any gang leader the Americans have had since. And they've actually calmed down a lot since she appointed her son-in-law. Because women in these positions have more to prove. I also wanted to kind of play with that idea. I wanted to know what it felt like to absorb yourself so completely in imagining a pandemic for five years. And just as your book is complete, reality catches up to your imagination. I've been living in this fictional pandemic only to emerge into a real pandemic i immediately became much more paranoid than other people were around me and some people thought i was overreacting and now i'm like i was not overreacting i was completely right (laughs) because i spent so much time in this imaginary place it really helped clarify how horrendous the reality was going to be one thing it didn't help lauren with however was any kind of survival prep yeah i think that i i really felt it hard because I'd spent so much imaginative time living through that and of course that's how we manage our lives is kind of imagining ourselves into the future and imagining the present. Unfortunately that did not mean I was any better prepared. I have not managed to complete a paramedic course. I'm a terrible hoarder. I keep buying spaghetti. I have all the spaghetti in the world. Don't Shoot the Messenger is a podcast brought to you by The Daily Maverick. This episode was produced by Haji Mohammed Dauji, with sound engineering, editing and support by Bernard Kotzer, Tevya Turok Shapiro and Catherine Kotzer. You can listen to Don't Shoot the Messenger on The Daily Maverick's website, Apple Podcasts, Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts. For more, subscribe to The Daily Maverick's newsletters and follow us on Twitter and Instagram.